me, I'm head of the Scots campus. Um, and we're very pleased to have so many here tonight. Um, I'd like to introduce Mr. Tom Van again, our Director of Student Wellbeing. And um, he's looking for his glasses. He's looking for his glasses. Thank you. I'll hand over to Tom. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Tracy. I thought if I wrote in a 16 point, I wouldn't need the glasses, but I was wrong. I'd like to join Tracy in thanking, thanking you all for coming out tonight and being with us. As Tracy said, I'm the Director of Student Wellbeing here at the college. And uh, when I say here at the college, that's across all three campuses. That's the Scots College, the Scots, the Scots campus here, the All Saints campus, but also the Lith Lithgow campus as well. So my, my roles and responsibilities stretch across all three of those. Um, I'm also a science teacher and in the end that's why I got into teaching, it's why I'll remain in teaching. Uh, it's my 30th year of teaching science now and I'll, I'll continue to be a science teacher. It's still why I, I choose to get up in the morning and um, to be in a school environment because I, I get to share the, the, the joy of science with, well probably yeah, thousands of kids by now after 30 years I guess including some, I was down at uh, the Lithgow campus a few weeks ago and I was with the pre-Ks and some of, the, some of the parents were coming in to get them at the end of the day and they said to the, to the, to the teachers, there's this strange man with a beard in the, in the pre-K room. But a couple of the parents said, that's Mr. Dan Gann, isn't it? And, and, and the, the teacher said, yeah, how do you know? And they said, he taught me when I was at last cell, because I, I taught for six years down at last cell academy, so I'm now getting that age where I'm starting to see the, uh, the, the kids of, 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 of kids that I taught. Which means I'm getting older, I guess. And hopefully even more mature, but you'd have to ask my wife about that one. Um, so, I'm the Director of Student Wellbeing, but I'm also a science teacher, and that's why this evening is really exciting to me. Because while all of our teachers play an important role in the pastoral care of our students, as part of my role, I've got a special responsibility to explore opportunities that may be of benefit to all of our students. So positive psychology, and in particular its application in schools known as positive education, represents a fusion of my professional positions, and therefore appeals to both sides of my teaching brain, if you like, such as it is. It utilises the rigour of the scientific method in order to investigate ways in which we can assist our young people to grow and thrive in their studies, their relationships and in their behaviour as well. The college's venture into positive education is no small shift in thinking because it is a way of thinking, a way of doing that involves all staff, both teaching and non-teaching and informs all of our daily interactions with all of our students. It's not an undertaking to rush into and it's certainly far too important to be undertaken without expert guidance and support. So it's my pleasure this evening to introduce you to Dr. Paul Robinson. Dr. Robinson is the Man Managing Director of the Positive Psychology Institute in Sydney. She's a leader in the field of positive psychology and its application in schools, having worked with over 500 schools throughout Australia. Dr. Robinson worked extensively with Mr. John Wexon in establishing the positive psychology ethos that has transformed the Knox Grammar School. We're very excited that Dr. Robinson will be working closely with all of our college staff for the very, very real benefit for your sons and for your daughters. Dr. Robinson will, will commence working tomorrow with a pilot group of teaching and non-teaching staff from both the All Saints and the, the Scots campuses. This evening she will share with us some evidence-based practical activities that will help us and our families to thrive at home, at school and at work. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please join me in welcoming Dr. Paula Robinson. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Such a pleasure to be here and I admire all of you for coming out. It's not always easy at night to drop everything, families, work, dinner and come along. So I know you're committed parents and I admire you for being here, so thank you so much. I'm um, so happy to be working with John again and All Saints. Uh, John is an absolute pleasure to work with. He knows this field very well, so it's always uh, very easy for me uh, to give John some ideas and some ways of doing things because he gets it, so as Tom does as well. 
And I guess building wellbeing and resilience are not laughing matters these days. And I'm going to take you through a presentation today that I hope will give you some introductory foundational knowledge and tips that you can go away and go, yeah, I think I'm starting to understand what this is because it is a complex topic or uh, set of topics, but I think you'll enjoy learning about it as I do. So I guess um, one of the things I like to do first is to say to you, when people talk to you about these very complex topics, uh, these topics aren't like a broken arm or a broken leg that you can see. These are things that often are inside our head. And I think it's really important that the person talking to you is qualified. And I go into a lot of schools and I see a lot of self-help people coming along and talking to parents and to teachers and frightening them to students. And I've seen a lot of things that I haven't liked, but I've also seen a lot of really well done <coughs> programs. So I like to put my qualifications up for you first. And I am a lecturer, you'll see down the left hand side that I lecture at a number of universities uh, on a regular basis. I am a global representative for the International Positive Education Network, which takes in schools from all over the world, so I know what's happening. I present regularly, particularly on the Knox Grammar Program, which is one of the best in the world, our top three. So I present on that. I'm a CEO of two companies. I'm a registered psychologist. I have a PhD in well-being. Um, I am a science practitioner. I'm always trying to bridge the gap between the science and the practice because I'm a very practical person, but I'm a scientist at heart as well. So I, I want both. So people like me just try and take the science and make it practical for people like yourself and me. Working with schools, um, I, I also review uh, journal articles in the space, uh, international science journal articles, so I review for two of those. So I hope you trust me. I hope that you realise I do know the topic well. I know the, the problems with it and I know the advantages. So I want you to be comfortable that, uh, that you will be getting best practice. But I think that's important when you're a parent. Um, in, in our role at um, PPI and also at Apply, we're now really, wellbeing is such a hot topic globally, we're now showing it and, and practicing it across about five domains. And I don't know if you can read that, but it's basically saying positive self and families. So we're looking at individuals and families, parenting, <coughs> children, whoever comes under that umbrella, we're looking at positive aging, aging well. We're getting a lot of science through globally now that um, older people can learn these skills and techniques and take it into their retirement or any challenges that they have. And I'm hoping to bring some of these topics uh, here because we want um, Scots to be sorry, here. we want uh, Scots All Saints to be a centre of excellence for the Central West in these areas. And I'm sure you'll agree that ageing and community and local council policy and all, all the businesses in the area and the schools, they all work together to bring up the children. It takes a village to raise a child. So we hope to give you all um, information on all those life domains because many people in this room have older parents, their family members, they run businesses and it all fits into the same structure. So I'm hoping to give you a lot more of information on that over the next several years. So what are we going to do now? Today or tonight we're going to talk about what is wellbeing and why does it matter? It's a bit of a strange word, wellbeing, so I'm going to take you and, and, and introduce it to you. Uh, what is positive education and why would that matter? Uh, how is wellbeing being embedded in schools? And also some tips. Uh, I've got quite a few tips for you, uh, introductory tips that will show you and get you started on, on the journey of, uh, of wellbeing and positive psychology. So let's start with the what. Now, the first thing I want to ask you, I want you to talk to each other and decide in five, five words or less what do you most want for your children. Five words or less. What do you want for them? You love them. What are the words that you used to say, I would really be wanting this for my child? Want to feel a 
child in life? What would be the words that you would choose? Anybody brave enough to go? It's very really simple, really. Yes. Well, um, integrity. Yes. Honesty and integrity, absolutely crucial. Purpose. Purpose, meaning and purpose in life. You're talking about all well-being topics. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Any others? Self worth. Self worth. Self. We call it in psychology self-efficacy, self-belief. I believe that I'm good enough. I believe I can do it. Really important. That's a very big predictor of many life outcomes. Any any others? Happiness. We want we want them to be happy as much as possible, don't we? And to feel good about life. Yes. Anything else? Resilience. It's a, a big topic too in the well-being literature. We can teach resilience, which is good. Anything else? Don't sweat the small stuff. Don't sweat the small stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> How do I get those thoughts out of my head that you know make me feel so bad? And often we ruminate about the, the smallest things. Thoughts are not facts. <coughs> Thoughts are not facts. Thoughts are stories we tell ourselves and our children tell ourselves and often they're not correct. So often we've got to challenge our thoughts and say, is that right? Should I be saying that to me, to myself at the moment? What else? Open-mindedness. Open mindedness. Growth mindset. Growth mindset. We're going to talk about that today. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm educated parents. <laughs> Very true. And look, the research really reflects Happiness, confidence, contentment, balance, kindness, health, satisfaction. Where the sort of satisfaction with life is like, how do I feel? Do I feel good about life? That's what came out of the research. Now, when we look at the next question, in five words or less, what do schools teach? So I have a think about that for a second. What do what we traditionally, and, and usually quite well, teach at school? Reading, writing, and teaching. What else? Pride. Sorry? Pride. Pride? Yes? Manners, respect. Manners, respect, discipline, yeah, all those things. Social skills. Social skills, one would hope so, is certainly the biggest predictor of many outcomes in life too, and whether your skills socially work. Bigger predictor than the HSC mark, I'll tell you that. Much bigger, scientifically. Anything else? Uh, value. Yeah, participation, teamwork, collaboration are so important in life. Well, you know, you're not quite wrong. I mean, here's what, what happened. Achievement, obviously. Academics, which is very important, thinking skills. Um, success, conformity, literacy, mathematics, discipline. They were the kind of words that have come out in, in the literature. And a lot of this was done with parents. So, then, where do we go with those two sets of skills? We go to skills of achievement, and skills of well-being, the happiness, the contentment, the integrity, all of those things. And what we want to teach in positive education is both. And without compromising either. We still want the great academic um, school education, but now we want to integrate the skills of well-being into that. And that's really what positive education is. It's combining the two, integrating them. There's another definition for you we've had published. Um, in development of education environments that enable the learner to engage in the established curricula in addition to knowledge and skills to develop their own and others' well-being. That's more about the environment of the school, sustainability, school culture. Because we don't want to be teaching one thing and then the culture of the school is something else. So they have to marry. So we want the school environment to reflect well-being. So okay, let, let's now get into that. Now what is, is this thing called well-being? I want you to create for me a single sentence on the difference between happiness and well-being. So if you said happiness is and well-being is, what would that be? What would the difference be between the two? Any ideas? Happiness is a feeling. Happiness is a feeling, it's an emotion, positive emotion. What about well-being then? Sorry? Yeah, it's more holistic, isn't it? And, and it's not about being happy all the time. And this is what always frightens me about the words like positive psychology and positivity, that you think we've got to be happy all the time. And that, what would that be called? If you were happy all the time, what would that be called? 
a mental illness. <laughs> I'm a pessimist by nature, right? So if I was with somebody who was happy all the time, I'd be going nuts. Like, oh, leave me alone. Like, I see the, the, you know, I'm naturally a pessimist. So to be around, you know, somebody always happy and always positive, I think I would first, as a psychologist, book them in somewhere for treatment and say this is a very risky behaviour. So I don't want you to think that this is about happiness. Or, of course, we all want more of that. Of course, that just goes without saying. But well-being is a very holistic thing. It has a lot of components. It's not about happiness. That's just a mood. Happiness comes, happiness goes. If you've got it all the time, it's a sickness. So we want more of it, but we don't want it all the time. But we want meaning and purpose in our life. We want resilience. We want acceptance of things we can't change. We want um, to learn about why we're here. You know, not, not um, what is the meaning of life, but what's the meaning in my life? What gives me meaning when I get up every day and go to work or go to school or cook the kids breakfast? That's meaning in your life and it matters. You know, so it's the topics, some of the topics we cover, relationships, etc., are, are quite deep. Uh, values of people we cover, really holistically in well-being. It's a very, very holistic, uh, broad area of research and practice. And we teach all of it. And it, most of it can be learned and developed. So that's the exciting thing for our children. And, and I guess the thing that I would then say is why would we want to put it in schools as well as our lives? And unfortunately, um, our children are statistically suffering quite badly and it's not getting any better. John and I were just talking about a 2018 report, uh, mental illness in our young people. 10 to 14, was it, John? Yeah, 15 to 19. 15 to 19 has gone up by 10%. And uh, depression, anxiety, chronic stress, not acute stress, because stress is a good thing a lot of the time because it keeps us going. But chronic stress, uh, negative stress over long periods of time is really dangerous. But our kids are getting depressed. Now, when I say our kids are getting depressed, I used to have teenagers coming into my house from my daughter's school saying, oh, poor, I've got depression. And I would say, no, darling, you're just having a bad day. It's not depression. Depression is a clinical thing that we can treat quite effectively. But children are being told so much about anxiety and depression that they're starting to think that they've got it. You know, when they're not diagnosed with a clinical issue at all, they're just having a bad day. But they, if, if we talk too much about anxiety and depression, even though we know it's there, it starts to become part of their language. So we have to be very careful with that. But the kids are under pressure. I mean, you know, I often spend all night talking to you about all of the things that have changed and which you know in this last maybe 10, 15, 20 years. And our kids are navigating that as, but I think we're navigating it as parents as well. So families are at risk, and I don't know if you can sort of identify to any of that. Some of us work hard, stress before and after work, we're running all day. Sometimes we get into the workplace and we get harassed. You know, discrimination is life, and anger in the workplace is massive. People aren't sleeping, yes? Parents aren't sleeping as much. You know, before they invented the light bulb, we slept 10 hours a night before Edison, and now we're sleeping not enough. Not enough. Sleep is a big predictor of well-being. It's a basic, I know, but again, we could spend a couple of hours here just talking about how to fix that. And of course, our kids have got their heads in their screens, and the brain thinks it's morning. So while you're getting tired in front of the TV, the kids are in front of the blue screen and their brain thinks they're awake. This is morning, this is daytime. Because that's the message that's being sent back to the brain. So we have to learn how to manage our devices and to have our kids sleep because it's really bad. That's a 2014 study I'll let you read, uh, WHO World Health. Um, I've just looked at the update one coming out next year and it's actually worse than that. So suicide is ranking number three among causes of death. I know children at my daughter's school who commit suicide, I'm sure you do, have heard too, and it's, it's not a joke anymore. Uh, we've really got to address this. But I guess the great thing is that when we talk about well-being, it's a great predictor of outcomes. 
The science is saying if your child has high levels of well-being, their academic results go higher. We saw that at Knox, didn't we, John, over the year, how much you climbed up the academic. And as, as we were measuring well-being, the academic performance was going up almost uh, at the same time, highly correlated. But we know engagement. When you feel good, you're more engaged in, in the learning and you participate as a team member more. Staff stay at schools that have higher levels of well-being. It attracts the best staff, actually. Uh, we have improved social and emotional skills. We don't see as much bullying. We, haven't, uh, we know if the teacher well-being, if the teacher walks in the room and her well-being is high, the students pick it up pretty much in microseconds. The teacher walks in the room and they're having a bad day, the children pick it up. We learn better when we're in a good mood. That's very well documented. So it's like me as a psychologist, you've got to check yourself at the door, you've got to check yourself as a parent. What am I bringing into the room? Am I one of those people who's a bit of a whinge up every day, you know? Or do I want to bring something more positive into my colleagues, into my classroom? So teacher wellbeing predicts student wellbeing, and student wellbeing predicts academic performance. There's studies on this, um, but the big one is the bottom one. It prevents onset of uh, clinical depression and anxiety disorders. So wellbeing is not one of those fluffy things. And if you look at this, I'm showing you from your own perspective, if we can get your wellbeing up, these are the outcomes that we're seeing in the scientific literature. Now, if somebody said to you, you can get these types of outcomes just through putting well-being practices in your daily life, you would want some, wouldn't you? And you would certainly want it for your children. So I really want you to be clear that when we talk about well-being, we're not just, you know, seems like a good idea or, oh yes, let's all get happy. It's not like that at all. It's actually life outcomes for your children and indeed yourself matter. focus on grows. Do you know the heliotropic effect? The heliotropic effect says people just like plants grow towards the light. They grow towards things that are positive. They, they want more positivity. The brain functions better when it's in a good mood. So what we've got to now do as parents is we have to start speaking the language of well-being. We don't want to be speaking negative or problem-centered, um, what, what's happening that's wrong, we have to learn solution-focused language. And what we focus on grows means that all we focus on well-being, the more chance we have of improving not only prevention of mental illness, but quality of life. Now, positive psychology is the umbrella, not the only one. Traditional psychology comes into this too. But what we know, this is out of Cambridge University, if anybody has been on their website, they have a massive well-being institute at Cambridge. And they talk about the well-being curve. And they show where people are at a moment in time. So they might be, you might have a mental disorder for a period of time, and you go and see somebody and you get fixed. You might be a languisher, 
And I guess when schools are merging and times are changing, we see a lot of languishing, a lot of people don't like change, you know, so you hear a lot of negativity around that, but there's also many good things about change as well. So some of us are languishers, and we're sort of those people that wander around going, oh, how do you feel? Oh, I don't feel that great. You know, I'm not having a great week or a year or a month. You know, and you sort of avoid them a little bit, don't you? Because I just don't want to hear that story again. And we don't want to be one of those people, that's for sure. But what we've studied is that most of us are moderately mentally healthy. But the last 25 years, we've been studying the top of the Cambridge curve, the well-being. What is it about people? that function really, really well. Why haven't we been studying them? We've been worrying about the disorder for so long, we forgot about the people at the top end of the curve. So that's my space, that's where I am now. I know the other stuff, but I'm up there in the world being, and I, that's what I teach and that's what I learn, because it's very, very valuable at school and certainly as a parent. Now we haven't got a video tonight, so I was going to show you what is positive side, but you can have a look on YouTube and there's a really good summary. But it's basically the scientific study of well-being. That's it. And it's, it's huge at the moment. Okay, so let's start having a look at the how. I hope I've convinced you the what and the why, what is well-being and how important it is. Um, at the school here and also in your family life, you have to lay foundations. You've got to start somewhere. And what we find a lot of the times, people have a lot of little bits and pieces, but we need to put it together holistically. So we've got to shape structures here at the school, and you have to shape structures at home as to how can I have my home structured so that well-being becomes top of mind in the things that we do on a daily basis. Now, in schools, we use different models for well-being. So we take some schools develop their own models. You can see Knox Total Fitness in the middle there. That's what we developed for Knox Grammar. Um, my mental fitness model sits underneath Total Fitness. That's the, the psychological um, component. Up the top, the well-being framework for schools. That is now mandatory by the Department of Education. That every school in New South Wales under the Department of Education has to have a well-being program. But you know, then you go into the how, which is what we're doing now. But I want you to be aware that you've really got to have a language and some kind of framework to put the activities and practices in, otherwise, it's sort of a little bit all over the place. So, I'm going to show you today and give you some tips uh, as, as family members on the mental fitness model because we know it well and we've been using it for a really long time. So this is how we, we talk about mental fitness and developing well-being. So we first say to people, like, how's, how's your physical health? You know, and, and they'll usually give you an answer, oh, you probably think now, like, well, it's pretty good, I haven't got a bad disease, I haven't got an injury, a physical injury, and I'm not being treated for anything, so, you know, I'm feeling pretty good. Yeah? Is that how you think you would judge your physical health? <coughs> yeah, maybe? Good. Then we would ask you, how's your physical fitness? And what would you say to that? What would be some of the things that you would say? Sorry? Average. And how would you measure it though? How would you measure it? You say, you know, maybe I'm going to stop exercising or I'm not doing as much as I used to or I'm a bit spasmodic. What's the one thing about physical fitness that we know to be true? have to keep doing it. Yes? That's the annoying thing. It's not stored, right? So you actually have to go, oh, I'm going to go for a walk today, or you know, I'm going to go and lift those weights, or I'm going to go to the gym. So physical fitness is kind of like optimal functioning, isn't it? It's something you do kind of like at the top end of that curve, being physically fit. I can, you know, I've got a routine, I've got habits, practices, I can feel it when I pick things up, I don't puff when I run. All of those things is a measure of physical fitness. And then I would ask you, how's your mental health? People don't like talking about mental health. I like talking about their physical health. I'll tell you all day about their physical health. But when you ask them about their mental health, don't you usually go, I'm okay. And then you think, well, no, I don't have a, a mental disease, I don't have a brain injury, and I'm not being treated for anything, so I'm probably mentally healthy. Yeah? Good. Okay. Then I would ask them, 
how's your mental fitness? And then they can't answer me because they don't know. And this is the well-being space. But we try and encompass it into language that is a little bit more easy to understand. And then you think, oh yeah, I now understand. Physical health, physical fitness, mental health, mental fitness. So there's things you can do, habits and practices, that actually can take you up that curve. So we've then scientifically taken mental fitness and given it four components. And we just call them exactly the same as physical fitness. Strength, flexibility, endurance, and team. Yeah? So that we found, particularly with students and families, it becomes easy to talk that language. It's not emotive, it's not religious, it's not a different language because fitness is universal, isn't it? Everybody understands what fitness is. It's optimal functioning. So at Knox and in many schools and certainly in many organisations now around the world, we talk about mental fitness, competitive edge. What do I have to do to be mentally fit? People want to be mentally fit. If you say you want to be mentally healthy or you want to improve their well-being, sometimes it doesn't get that cut through. But mental fitness seems to do better. So basically, I'm giving you this example of the model because I think everybody in this room understands fitness. So when I'm teaching you these practices, you can think about improving your mental fitness. Mental fitness doesn't have stigma. The words don't have stigma. Like mental health has a lot of stigma, but mental fitness doesn't. It is a universal language. So I can improve your well-being under the mental fitness banner without you thinking too much about mental health. I can say to you a fit mind and body are equally important. I'm just doing a program at the AIS Association of Inter uh, Independent Schools. We're embedding mental fitness into their PDHPE curriculum because fitness is a language that is understood. So it's something, fit mind, fit body, that's what we did at Knox, total fitness. And then of course, what we have to get our children to understand is it doesn't happen overnight. Fitness is something you work at and hopefully enjoy to some degree and that you do it regularly and all of a sudden your brain has turned it into a habit. It says, oh, I like this and it will tell you to do it more often. After about three weeks of doing something regularly, the brain actually creates a neural pathway. Which is exciting because if our kids are struggling, we know very readily with practice that we can change that for them. Which is very exciting and we're just so happy that we can do that. If you want to know about, a lot of people ask me this, which is why I've got this slide before you. Isn't it genetically predetermined, you know, well-being? It really isn't. About half of people's well-being is developmental. It's not where you live, your external circumstances. As long as we've studied people in India and we know that if you've got a roof over your head, a job, food on the table, kids in school, basic needs, their mental health and well-being is almost identical to yours. So if you've got three cars, four houses, 45 pairs of shoes, ladies, your mental health and people with the basic needs is actually not statistically different, which is interesting. So sometimes we think by when kids think by buying more things, that is actually going to change our mental fitness, but it doesn't. It just changes our happiness, our feeling good for that moment. What changes if you get a child buying themselves a new pair of shoes and a child going and doing a good deed for another person? that child's well-being will increase and stabilise for a much longer period of time. That's just how the brain works. So buying things and doing, having more assets and, and more things actually doesn't matter. We know actions and thoughts are the big predictors. We don't think genetics has dropped to about 30% now because of neuroplasticity research. So we're not even sure genetics because genes are now being turned on and off. So it's, you know, we're, we're just not sure about that genetic component. But what you think and what you do, actions and thoughts. When your child gets up in the morning, the first thoughts that child has can predict what happens for them for the whole day, how they feel. If you have the news on in the house in the morning and it's bad news, you know when you turn on the Today Show and the news is on, 
I promise you, if the child sees something that they are not, that distresses them or upsets them, the research says that mood will stay with them for six to eight hours on that day. So what you do is where I'm talking about structures in your home, what the child does, their thoughts, their actions. We want them to wake up in the morning and get them feeling good and we want them to go off to school feeling good. So little things like that can make a big difference. And, and when I say to people, your thoughts and your actions in the morning when you wake up and start your day, that affects everybody in the home. As parents, what we do is role modeling. And students and our, our kids learn from our actions much more than our words. Actions, not words. It's the implicit memory in the brain. It runs concurrent with work. When they process words, the implicit memory is processing actions. So if you're drinking 20 beers and you're saying to your child, you know, drinking is no good for you, the child will learn about your behaviour, not about your words. That's just the way the brain works. So it's what you do, not what you say, interestingly. What you say matters, but not nearly as much as what you, you roll on. And I think we lose that sometimes. I mean, I know I do. You, know, you forget sometimes. What did I just do? You know, it's interesting. So, so basically, I really want you to know that mental fitness starts with you. All of the practices and habits, it's only an intro tonight, they, if you can adopt them first as a role model, your child will pick them up. You'll say they won't. Like, believe me, I know from my own children, because I'm the voice in their head now that they've grown up, and they go off telling people about all the things, you know, that keep them resilient through the hard times and the things that I've taught them. And a lot of this stuff is not rocket science. It's simple, easy stuff. So I'm going in now after waffling on for a while and hope that I've convinced you that it's important to develop your mental fitness and your well-being. I want to start by saying, how do we bring this now to practice in your home every day? If this is not right, these are the foundations of mental fitness. These are the wonder drugs. They're free. They are drugs because they change your brain. If you exercise for 30 minutes, three to four times a week, your brain chemistry is exactly the same as a person taking an antidepressant. Exactly the same. Exercise is a drug. It's free. No side effects, which is good. But people who don't exercise, I actually personally really do not like exercise. You know, I'm a couch potato. You know, if the couch is there and I've got to go out for a walk, oh gee, it's inviting. But I've learned the habits of mental fitness. If I go out for that walk, then I will feel better and function better. So even if it's that incidental exercise, you know, 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, it changes your neurochemistry. If your children are not exercising regularly, and I'm sure at the school they are, I promise you their mental health is low. So we've got to get them moving. That's just, it's so simple, but it gets forgotten. The second thing is sleep. Get the devices away from them to at least two hours, or put the uh, blue screen, you know, you get rid of the blue screen on the other uh, a few things you can buy. My daughter's got glasses that stop the blue light. The blue light is a message to the brain that you are wide awake. Wide awake goes to the back of the occipital lobe. You are wide awake. So if your children are on devices and you want them to go to sleep, you can just about forget that. Because they'll go to bed and they'll be like this. Because their brain thinks it's daytime. The brain hasn't evolved enough, it hasn't adapted yet to all of this stuff that our kids are doing. So you've got to have these boundaries because sleep is a huge predictor of mental health and well-being. Huge. If you're tired, how do you feel? Low. Energy's low, don't want to run, just want to go to sleep, put my head on the Nutrition is another one. So many studies now about sugar and brain. Learning, mood, how I feel, ADHD, all coming out now in the research. If your child is having a lot of sugar in the day, there's a problem. So we have to replace it, particularly those low GI foods where they last for longer. But in school canteens, in your home, your attention goes to what's on the shelves. 
You know, oh, I see a chocolate bar. That's what your brain will want first. If you see a muesli bar, the brain will want that first. You've got to hide the bad stuff and keep introducing the good stuff because they will function so much better. So these are the first three things I would say to you tonight for yourself and your family, and particularly your children. If this is not right, you've got to have a look at it. And you've got to make changes. And that will your mind, but you're the boss. Yeah? And that will change their mental health. So let's have a look at a couple of ideas for you. Let's have a look at mental fitness flexibility. Mindset. Now, one lady who was saying mindset, you've had a look at this work, have you? It's fantastic, isn't it? Mindset is a very hot topic. Our thoughts and attitudes that may help or hinder you at work school or in your life as a parent. And you see that catch the ants now? No ants? Does anybody know what ants are? Our kids have that. Kids have ant farms in their head. Automatic negative thoughts. Automatic negative thoughts. We want to turn them into pets, performance enhancing thoughts. So if your child says, I'm never going to be good at maths, never going to be good at science, guess what? They won't, because it's the thought. The thought is, I'm never going to be able to do this, I'm not as good as Johnny next to me, and that's it. That thought has now decided that child's future in science. A teacher said to my child, once you're not very good at maths, guess what she didn't do in her HSV? And she was seven when she was told that. So words matter. They get ants in their head. They haven't got the brain power to analyse it. So they never forget what you tell them. If you say to the child you're stupid, guess what? That's what they'll think for a very, very long time. Unless they come to a psychologist and we try and undo it. So basically we want performance enhancing thoughts, turning ants into pets. And we also want to encourage what we call a growth mindset. Now, let's have a look at what that is. The fixed mindset says that people in this room with a fixed mindset might think that intelligence is fixed. So I can test your IQ and say, OK, your IQ is this. And you would think, well, some of us are more clever than others, aren't we? Some of us are not so clever. Fixed mindset. That actually is not true. The research now is saying intelligence is malleable. It moves, given the right opportunity. And this is what we're just learning in probably the last 20 years. So IQ is really a thing of the past. Somebody with an average IQ, which is most of us, and high motivation will outperform somebody with high IQ and low motivation. So motivation is the key. I want to do it. It means something to me. But you've got to forget this Mr. Clever and Mr. Stupid. It doesn't exist anymore. So we've got to put it like you. There are people, of course, very gifted people and people with low learning ability, but they're outside the normal. They're very rare. So most of us really start on the same page. So we want you children to develop a growth mindset and believe that they are a work in progress, that they're just starting out to learn, lifelong learning. So let's have a look. In the growth mindset research, people believe intelligence can grow and be strengthened with effort. We know that's true. Basic abilities can be developed, but you've got to be dedicated, hard work, brains and talent are just a bit of a starting point. Believe, capable, uh, believe you're capable of achieving what you want if you put the time and effort to get there. How many times have you said, gee, I did well on that, but gee, I put in a lot of effort? And that's school, isn't it? So we want to master your mindset with a lot of learning and resilience, always improving. If you in this room have a fixed mindset, you intend, you will probably be thinking that way. I'll let you believe that. So schools with a culture of growth mindset are certainly improving performance of children and also in the home. So I can't play this for you because we haven't got the video set up with sound, which I didn't know, but there's an um, interview with Steve Jobs, which I would have played for you, where he says that right through his early career, 
he kept asking people for help. He'd ring them up, he rang up leaders of big organisations saying, I want to learn this, can you help me? Now we know people with a growth mindset are always reaching out for help because they're saying, I don't know something, so I need help. But what happens with a um, fixed mindset is people hide the struggle. They want to appear intelligent. Do you know people like this? You know, I'm the smartest person in the room, they think. Seeking help is a growth mindset. So, what we asked the children after they watched the Steve Jobs interview of saying he just reached out and kept asking people for help because he just didn't know what he was doing. We asked them to look at that interview and say how would that interview have changed if he had a fixed mindset? And the kids will say, oh, well, he would have said, no, you know, I've done this all myself and, you know, I'm a really bright guy and, you know, I've managed to do this because I'm pretty intelligent and I've been able to, to grow the business and do a really good job. So basically, what happens with our children, and certainly us as adults, if we don't develop a growth mindset, we believe other people are better than us because they're smarter. But in the main, that's actually not true. In the normal course of life, it isn't true. So we're building now, and we go online and have a look at, at Mindset Works, uh, and it shows all the steps on how we build intelligence now by connecting neural pathways in the brain. And we can only do this now. We know it because we've been looking at people under fMRIs in the tunnel and seeing how their brain starts to build intelligence. We didn't know this before. So you can, your children are capable, but you have to start to look at this growth mindset and the way that your language comes out in the home. It's such a big thing. So you don't say, when they say, can I, you say, no, how can I? Now, it's not can I, yes, of course you can. But guess what? It's going to require effort, commitment, structures, sacrifices. Let's do a plan because you are very capable of doing this. Unless you want to do something ridiculous, you know, normal course of life I'm talking about, uh, you, you always put the word how. How can I do that? And then you help them do it. But they, they have to know how much effort. I can't do it. I can't do it yet. Yet is a big word in growth mindset. Because you know yourself, I have videos where you bring a little child, we have videos of little children who can't walk, and it shows all the videos of how many times they try to walk and eventually they're up straight and they're walking. So, you know, kids realise it's an effort to learn, it's an effort to grow, but you get rewarded for it. But unfortunately what's happening with this fixed mindset of children is they don't believe that they can do it. Remember we said thoughts and actions? These are the thoughts our kids are having. So we have to show them that they're very capable, but we have to set a plan in place to put the effort and commitment in, because nothing comes easy. But it's all also good when, it, when you get there. This is the book I would love you to get. Um, Carol Dweck, I'm hoping to get a couple of copies in the school. But it's brilliant, you can look, uh, Professor Dweck is also on a lot of YouTubes talking about this topic. Um, there's a lot of information online if you care to have a look. And she talks a lot about the research and a lot about the how-to. But the book's really good. It's a bestseller now. She's a British, she's at Stanford, she's done amazing work, Carol Dweck, D-W-E-C-K, PhD and her work now is in schools all over the world. But I want you to always think about that growth and fixed mindset and how you're representing to your children. And certainly teachers, we have to be really careful. They're doing things in schools like um, bringing their kids up in front of the class who don't get the maths problem right. They're saying, oh, could you please show us how you worked out that answer step by step? because that will help so many kids in the class, and then we can see where you went wrong, and then we can fix it for everybody. So these kids are getting up, and they're like little stuff. Well, I did this, yep, that was right, and then I did that, that's right, and then I think, yeah, you got school of that right. Then I did that, ah, oh, and the kids all say, that's the step that you got it wrong. And then they start working on the last 
parts of the puzzle. So they're celebrating errors. They're using the errors to say, this is how you learn. This is, it's good to make mistakes. We don't call mistakes, they're experiments. You know, all through life we experiment, don't we? Oh, that didn't work for me. Oh, that did. It's just an experiment. I mean, we go through life trying things, and what we don't want our children to do is stop trying. Because we tell them, ah, it's not really you, I don't think you're going to do that, you should try something, something else. So celebrate the things that go wrong, and say, so let's work out where you went wrong, and how, how can you move into the next step? That growth mindset, really, really important. But please get that book. Uh, I think it's even an electronic form now. I think it's wonderful for parents. It's been a great, a great book for me as a parent, really, really. Okay, so let's have a look at one strength thing that you might like to do at home. So I've got a strength and why do we care? This is foundational work in positive psych and well-being. Now, I'll let you read those. Individuals in business are now benefiting from knowing and using their strengths. I'm going to show you what that is in a minute. Resilience, goal attainment, happiness and awareness, stress, high engagement, and the workplace, we're seeing strengths-based organisations. Now, what happens with strengths is psychology spent a long time looking at weakness. What's wrong with you and how can we fix it? Yeah? Most of psychology came from the Second World War and, and indeed the First World War where there were people with problems and we had to learn to fix those problems. But now we've gone to the other end of the curve. We're saying, what are your strengths? What is it about you as an individual that makes you feel really good? We know with strengths, when you're using your strengths, that you feel alive and you feel like it comes a lot easier. So we can measure strengths now, and a lot of schools are doing that. I'm not big on measuring kids, but we can certainly show them the root measurements and things like that. But we also do strength spotting, so we discuss the strengths of your child. Now, I want you to talk to the person next to you right now before I show you this. Tell, tell the person next to you what are the strengths of your child. If you had to describe them, what are they? Being goes through the roof. So if you don't know what they are, I would ask you as parents that when you go out tomorrow, go through your day and at the end of the day, see how you feel. If you've used some of your own personal strengths in that day, you'll feel pretty good. If you haven't, you're going to feel not so good. Now let me show you. Have you got, got a bit of a language there? This is a huge area of research, foundational and positive psych. So they started to develop, and I know it's hard for you to see, we're going to put this up on the website over the next couple of weeks so you've got a copy of it. But they went and they did about 10 years of research around the world. And they started to look at character. What are the things that we value, it's called the VIA, values in action, in human beings? You said integrity, honesty. Some of them found about 24 character strengths that were valued by every country, every religion, all ages, both genders, and it didn't matter whether it was a third world country or a first world country, these were the top 24. And I don't know if it means that they've just mapped them in the middle onto virtues, but you don't have to worry about that. But let me give you some of them. Now, I'll give you an example. One of my strengths, my top strengths, is love of learning. Comes out every time I get this. Love of learning. What do you think I would feel like if I was in a job that I was doing the same thing every day? Depressed. <laughs> Terrible. And I did do that for a big part of my life. Repetitive job. But my one of my strengths is I love to learn. You know, I like to when's the new scientific article coming out? You know, what's new? You know, what can I learn today? That's me. That's who I am. And if I'm in a job that doesn't allow me to do that, I feel flat as a tap. Now, I might be able to do it every day, I run a business, I've got to do my admin, I've got to do you know, all those things that I don't like, but I have to use that strength in order to feel good and to feel like, you know, oh, I'm good at this, I can do it, it's really exciting. And when you look at those strengths, they are exactly what we want to develop in our kids. 
Persistence is the strength. Some kids are more persistent. It's not one of mine, so I usually try and partner in my work with somebody who thinks things are getting a bit tough, that they have the strength of persistence at the top. These are great character strengths. Uh, let me give you a couple. Curiosity. It's highly correlated with well-being. To be a curious person. Who in the room has got a child that's very curious? Always asking, oh, what's that? Why is that? What they've learned in the character strengths is you can overplay the strength or underplay it, depending on how you're using it. So let me give you an idea. So if you think that what would be the opposite of curiosity? What would be something that you would think would be opposite? Yeah, exactly. Beautiful. Maybe boredom. They're saying that absence of curiosity is disinterest. And if you overplay it, you're a bit of a nosy parker. <laughs> So it's good to be curious and have it as a strength, but in the end you've got to be careful how you use it. Yeah? One of mine is appreciation of beauty and excellence. You know, I like things to be done well and to be good, but that can stop me from proceeding, because if it's not at that level, I lose interest, which is why I'm not consistent. So you can talk about the character strengths in so many different ways. Let me give you another one. Open-mindedness. Gullibility. You know the people that are really gullible? They're so open-minded that they believe everything you tell them. Well, they just might not reflect at all on anything. Or they might be a cynic. So you can get these 24 character strengths and you can talk about them in your everyday language. You can ask them, what, what's mum and dad's strengths? What are my strengths? And you can ask them figures. So you look at the character strengths and they say, well, Nelson Mandela, what sort of character strengths do you think he had? And, and what would be something you would say? Resilient. Sorry? Resilient. Resilient, absolutely. Persistence. Persistence, humility. And the kids start to get the words. And we teach this in class, in books, in English, in science. What was Edison? Edison was persistent because it took him 300 failures to invent the light bulb. Wasn't he persistent? Isn't persistent important sometimes? Do you see how you can start to talk about strengths rather than weaknesses? What about this guy? What's his strength? Persistent. Able player, I think, don't you? <laughs> but he's also pretty creative, don't you think? He was creative. I mean, he was creative, wasn't he? He used to come up with acne this and acne that. But you can have fun with the little ones on strengths too. And you can spot them using their own strengths. What about this guy? What was his main strength? Humor. He made us laugh, didn't he? Who, who doesn't love to laugh? I mean, some people are really good at making us laugh. Do you see how people have different strengths? What about Steve Wolf in sport? Yeah, leadership, absolutely. What else? Integrity. And also fairness and equity was one of his because he was always trying to help other people and, and be really fair in his job. And then I would ask you, when you think about those character strengths, you know, think about your own parents. If I said to you and you looked at all of those strengths that, that we found to be important, what would their strengths have been? They would have been integrity, would it be work ethic, would it be persistence, would it be love of learning, would it be gratitude. There's so many beautiful words in the strengths vocabulary. And in the culture of the school, I mean, John had the 24 character strengths embedded in the glass on both sides of the senior centre and the Grey Hall, didn't you, John? Because he wanted the boys to see character strengths every single day when they walked past it. So that was embedding it in the culture of the school and then getting the, the students and staff to talk about strength. Because we're really good at talking about what's wrong and what's weak. But we've got to change the conversation. So your child, I would say, Get that character strength diagram. We can, we're going to put it up at the school for you as well. But look at the 24 character strengths and start to get that language out there and spot it. Like when your child's brave, you see, gee, that's brave. You look brave. 
old person, look what you just did. And gee, that was honest. And gee, that, you just took a leadership role there. And you're a very grateful saint, thank you. It's really good to be grateful. You start to talk the language. We talk it in the school, we talk it in the home. It changes their brains. They start to look for a heliotropic effect. What you focus on grows. So we want these things for our children. That's what we need to talk about. We need to talk about them watching a TV show with them. Whatever it is, gee, you know, that was very fair. You know, just talking about them changes. So some of the ways we're introducing strengths, we first of all get to know them, the language of strengths. Then when we know what our primary ones are, because everybody's got different ones, we start to see how much we're using them. Like I said with love of learning, when I wasn't using it, I was pretty flat. When I started using it in my work, I started to feel better. So look for your children's strengths and make sure you're setting them in that direction. If they're good at something, push them in that direction. If they love it, if they like it, if it engages them. You know, you see when a child's spark is there when they're engaged. I have a lot of parents say, I want my son to be a lawyer. And I'll talk to the child and the child wants to be a carpenter because he loves building things. You know, go let our kids find their, find their strengths and we have to help them with that. So really important and then spotting that language, spotting them in others. Okay, let's have a quick look at team. How am I going for time? Am I all right? I'm getting tired and I was... You all right? I want to just give you one out of each and then so, so move on to team. Now this is number one in all the research. Positive relationships in our life. Number one, all countries, all ages, both genders, all religions, all cultures. We are a social species. And if we don't have good relationships in our work, our school and our life, our well-being is low. We know that. If you see somebody isolated at work or a child isolated, I promise you their well-being is low. Because we're social. We need each other. It's just the way we are. That's not going to change anytime soon. So, what Chris Peterson's work said that if you want life satisfaction and you want emotional well-being, look really carefully about who's in your life on a daily basis. Who are your children mixing with? Who are you mixing with? Who do you see on a regular basis? How do they make you feel? Now this sounds basic, doesn't it? You'll be surprised how this is not looked after at all in many families. And you go in and there's people really that don't add value to your life and the life of your children. And we've got to be a bit assertive around that. But it gives your life meaning. The people in your life give your life meaning. If they make you feel bad, that's what it means to you. I'm not a very good person. They make you feel good? No. Oh, I feel good when I'm with that person. Positive energy networks is the research. If anybody wants to look at it, they can matter. Now I'm going to give you a little test here. How to build a positive relationship really quickly with your child. Active, constructive, responding. ACR. So, here's what we know. The manner that you respond to the good news. Not the bad news. We're all really good at responding to bad news. Oh, I'm so sad to hear that. It's horrible. Come and have a cup of tea. We're good when something goes wrong. But how do you respond to good news? Now, here's the exercise. I want you to think of a recent example when your child shared some good news with you. How did you respond? So they might have come home and said, oh, guess what, Mum? Guess what, Dad? That's what happened today. Think about how you responded. And there's four levels of responses that we know of in this literature. So the told us some good news. Can you think what you said or what you did? Good, okay. So I'll run it through. Don't worry about reading it too much. There's four responses. Active, constructive is the best one. So your child tells you some good news. You turn to the child. You're engaged with the child. You're engaging with how they're feeling about this good news. So, oh, they're so happy about this. So you feel happy. Oh, they really enjoyed that. That's so important to them. I feel really good. We go, it's so fantastic. But you're giving off that, that you're actually feeling it with them. Do you know? Do you know that they really love the pressure doll? It's so fantastic. I'm so happy for you. It's like that with your friends and your family as well. 
The other way you might have responded, I was a bit of a passive constructing responder with my kids because I was very busy. So I'd come home and I'd be cooking dinner and my daughter might come in and say, oh, no, I won the race at school today. And I'd come, I'm playing, that's fantastic, you know? Really good. What do you want for dinner? What, spaghetti, did you say? Or, you know, I'd be on to the next thing. Yeah, you know, I'd sort of be pleased, but I was a bit passive. Like, I wasn't really engaged with how they were feeling. So I was pretty good at moving to the next thing really fast. My grandmother was an active, destructive responder. She used to say, I'd come home and say, Nan, I got a promotion at work. Nan would say, oh, gee, that's going to be a lot more work, isn't it? <laughs> well, late night's coming up for you. Gee, you're going to be tired. How much extra do they expect you to do? Do you know people like that? Doesn't matter how good the news is, they'll find something wrong with it. Do you know this? <laughs> Me too. It's, it's, it's painful. I had a client, her husband came home and said, oh, I got this great promotion. And she said, does that mean you're going to be late for dinner every night? You know, what does this mean to us? And, you know, it was immediately needed. So you've got to think that the more you engage actively, the more your well-being goes up with that person. And active constructive responding to the good news is something we don't do well as human beings. We're much better at the bad stuff. Some people don't respond at all. Passive destructive. You can tell them something good at work and they'll go, oh, what time's our next meeting? You know, there's no response. It's like, I'm um, straight. And people do this all the time. So in the culture of the workplace, we want you to think about at the school, with your kids, just got some good news. It's rare. We don't get a lot of good news in life. Sometimes we're just going through emotions. Can we just stop and enjoy it, please? Can we Velcro rather than Teflon? Because it's really, really important, as I'll show you the last thing that I'm talking about at the end. So positive relationships in practice, again, really, really simple. What is your relationship plan? This week coming, who, who is your children spending time with? Who are you spending time with? And are you actively creating an environment of people that are supportive, that care about you, that are not putting you down, not making you feel bad about yourself? I know some people have to be in your life, you know, and they're not always that great. Like one of my clients said, you know, my father-in-law, no, it's his mother-in-law. Oh, God, I want to get her out of my life. And I said, well, you're probably not going to be able to do that, but you don't need to see her every day. <laughs> you might need to be bad, because she used to say, oh, you're a loser. Do you know, yeah, you know people like that? You're a loser. Oh, your husband's a loser. Great. Well, you know what? I don't want to hear that every day, so he doesn't want to hear it. So all I'm saying is an exaggeration, but you've got to really plan who's in your life on a regular basis. And make sure you've got people that are supportive, that are adding energy, to what you're doing. And you can write this down at the dinner table with your kids. But in the classroom, if a child's struggling, is it the people that they're hanging out with, the other kids? Is the teacher making the classroom feel bad? Because as a psychologist, nobody sees worse things than I do over the years, but I have to check myself at the door. And I have to decide what am I bringing into that room? What am I bringing into that person's life? What, and how's that affecting me? Because I want to feel good too. Everybody has a choice in their life. In the classroom, at home with your kids, we've all got a choice. And we can choose to feel better and choose the activities that are going to make us feel better. It's a choice. Every day when you get out of bed, it's a choice how you feel. And you've got to start to learn about those thoughts and so do our kids. And the people, the first person you see in the morning, that child said, you ready for school? You're not late again, are you? You know? You've just got to change the language a little bit and motivate, be more motivating and supportive. I know it's hard sometimes, because you know I'm a pessimist by nature, and I'm just finding the bad stuff, but you can find the good stuff if you search for it. Last thing before you go, endurance. Building positive emotions. We said tonight when we started, happiness. Somebody said happiness, we said we don't want it all the time, didn't we? Because we wouldn't be feeling very well. We might have to go for a long break if we're too happy. But what I want to say to you, every grain 
is programmed with a negativity bias. We Teflon and we Velcro the bad stuff. If you go home tonight and one bad thing has happened to you today and there could have been lots of good things, you, what will you think about? The one bad thing. And that's what happens with our kids. Because our brain is hardwired to find the bad stuff and that's really, really important because it helps us survive. But we're not cavemen anymore. We actually haven't got the animals coming to try and kill us and the tribes. And unfortunately, every night when your child goes to bed, in, in the main, they're thinking about the bad stuff. So if you ask them to think about three good things about their day, just three. What were three good things about today? But the important extra question is why were they good? What was good about today? When you go to bed tonight and I turn the light off, I want you to think about three good things about your day and why they were good. Because this evolutionary bias is active and it's attacking our kids' brains every day. So we want them to velcro the good stuff. Um, the work of uh, Professor Barbara Fredrickson, again, another great book, says you need three positive emotions to counteract one negative. Three. Just to get the balance. And you've got to get those three because that tips you into the well-being range. If you, in the next hour, you experience three positive emotions and one negative, you're going to be feeling okay. If it's a one-to-one, -one, not so great. So what this research has taught us is we have to actively try and develop positive emotion for our kids. But unfortunately, your body functions better when you're in good mood. So your heart's beautiful. When you're frustrated or angry, your heart's not beautiful. It's struggling. The other organs of your body are struggling. So it becomes increasingly important now that we've learned this, how can we link emotions to our mental and physical health? Some people in their homes have a what's working well board. Has anybody had one of those? We had it in our house on average. Post-its, what worked well today? What worked well this week? Write it down, put it up on the board. Priming the brain. It's not a silly exercise because remember heliotropic effect, we're trying to get them to focus on the good stuff. So what's working well for you this week? You know? Now this school is going through its, its change, it's a merger, and many people in the school will be worried, a bit nervous, a bit angry. You know? it's a, for some people it's even a grieving process because you've got to let something go. But you've also got to think what you can gain and you've got to find how that's going to work for you. In life, that's what our kids have to do. Something goes wrong, something's not the way I want it. How can I move and make myself feel better about this? This is a great skill for all of us. So some people put what's working well boards up in their house. And whilst it sounds silly, it's called priming. Priming your brain to search for the good. That's what we need to do more of. This is, a lot of businesses now are doing this for teams. Anybody in the room who's, who works? What's working well in our team? What we focus on grows. We feel better, we feel confident. So it's not trite, it's actually good. And the other thing I would like you to think about, aside from that three great things about your day when you go home tonight and you lie down and why they were good, I want you to think about other mood boosting activities. When you or your family are feeling flat, what can you do? How can we boost the mood of the family? because everybody functions better when they're in a good mood. So we used to, I came up with a trick in my house because most arguments in my house were when we all got home. I got home from work and... So we decided music was a mood booster. So we found music that made us all sort of dance a bit around the house. You know, the, I'm a Queen fan, but you know, all of those songs that doesn't matter what age you are, everybody sort of has some fun with them. And we found that music, because it is very hardwired and it is primal, music was a really great mood booster. Talking to a friend, going for a walk will boost your positive emotion like that. What do you do to boost your mood? Some people have hobbies. Some, there's so many things that boost your mood. What, what are some ideas from you? Three mood boosters. Food. Food. Emotional eating. If it's good food, no problem with that at all. 
I love a good, just some good food around Bathurst too, huh? Good, beautiful food mine area. Indoor cricket. Indoor cricket. Get out and have a game. We positive mood and also uh, exercise. Fantastic. What else? Animals are animals in nature. I'm so glad you said that. They're two of the number one. That's why they've got them in nursing homes and things that actually change the neurochemistry if you give an animal a hug. And nature, getting out into nature, which you have so much around here, getting out of the office. If you're working in an office with no windows, your mood will be low. So you've got to get out there. What else? Sunshine is a mood booster, thank you. Depression and vitamin D are highly correlated. Just going outside and sitting outside and putting your face up, so nice. Under a tree, is there anything nicer than sitting under a tree in the sunshine? What else? Physical contact. Physical contact. 30 second hugs changes the neurochemistry. 30 seconds. Just a hug. Who doesn't love a hug? I forget sometimes I hug my kids, but now I've got them trained. They don't do it to me. Come on, Mum, I need a mood boost. Give me a hug. Trained, you know? How do I boost my mood? It's mental illness prevention we're talking about and optimal functioning. Anything else? Any other idea? You see, on the weekends when we're with our kids, we tend to do the things we don't like. Oh, I've got to do the washing, I've got to do the shopping. We all have to do that. But we have to identify things that we can do together to boost our mood. You know, make us feel good. What, what can we do today to make it better? Why don't we bring some music on? You know, what a movie? It doesn't make YouTube quit, it makes us laugh. It's something funny. But this is an active thing that you need to do in your life for mental illness prevention and improve quality of life and well-being. Okay, so I've given you some tips. There's certainly things that are going to be happening in the school. The well-being of your children is top priority, and the more we do, the better they will be, and you know that. One thing I want to say to you, though, is that going cute? Person activity fit is coming out in the science as really important. Don't ask people to do something they're not comfortable doing. Sometimes discomfort can be your friend. You think, oh, I don't really want to do this, but I'll give it a go. And you go, oh, I actually did enjoy that. But if it doesn't feel good, don't do it. Give it a go, and if you think, oh, it just doesn't feel right to me. What that's showing is if we do those activities, we actually don't improve our well-being at all. So you've got to pick something that you think, yeah, I can do that. So I want you to take a minute, now that I'm sick of hearing my own voice, but I am giving you four things tonight. Foundational, well-being, quick things that you can think about. Think about finding more about strengths, the language of strengths, character strengths in particular. How, what am I, what are my kids? How can I use the language? How can I use my strengths more often? If we all had the same strengths, we'd be dead. Everybody's got different strengths. That's how we survive as a species. So you start to spot them in people and name them. Name the strength. I just saw that. Then we get into the language and the culture of strengths. How you improve your positive emotional ratio will help you endure and build resilience. Endurance. What's your mindset with your child? Is it fixed or is it growth? <clears throat> Please don't forget intelligence in the normal range, which is pretty much all of us, is not fixed. We know that now. We didn't know it you know, 100 years ago. We didn't know it 50 years ago, but we know it now. So your child is very, very capable, but they need the effort, the commitment, the structure, the timing, all the things. And then, do you and your child have a positive relationship plan? And I want you to think about that every week. So even if you just said to me, there's one thing there, person activity fit, that I think is interesting to me, resonates with me. I would like to do more of that. These are really basic. I can give you a hundred things, but we're only together for such a short time. But these things in family life are really, really important. Spotting the strengths, making your child feel competent. Competence is the number one motivator. Competence, autonomy, and relatedness. CAR, C-A-R. 
I want to feel competent, I want some choice, I want some autonomy, and relatedness. We just did a massive masterclass on that drama at Knox and embedding self-determination theory, car, into the classroom. How do I create an autonomy-supported classroom and how do I ask, not tell? How do you give your children more autonomy? Give them choice where possible. Ask, don't tell. It's a big motivator. And relatedness, of course, we talked about relationships tonight, but making them feel confident, and you do that through that growth mindset. C-A-R, car, drives us all every day. Do I feel confident? Have I got any autonomy and relatedness? Do I belong? C-A-R, I have it on my computer. So I hope that helps a little bit. There are only little things. I wanted you to understand the what of all being, the why of all being, why it's important in school, why it's important in life and family, why it's really important as a family. I guess the thing that we always think about with mental fitness is just one step at a time. Doing some small things, set yourself up for success. You've got a wonderful school here that's moving much more into this space. So we'll have a lot more activities and things that you can learn and grow, like I've had and you know, many of us are all learning, we're all students, we're all growing in life, and we want our kids to have the best possible life. So it's very important. We've got a, a book um, we put out with Knox Grammar on practicing positive education, and we'll be having some, uh, I'm going to give you a copy uh, tonight for the school, and it's got a lot of this in there. We're we'll now having an electronic version, that the school will have as well. So you can look more at uh, in depth and not just an hour or two of me talking. Martin Sullivan's Flourish book is a good book um, on well-being, one of the first ones. The Optimistic Child, who's read that? That's a brilliant book. I think that's his best work. Have you, have you read that, Tom? Oh, brilliant. How, how to make your child more optimistic. Not rose-coloured optimists, we pessimists can't stand rose-coloured optimists, but I'm talking realistic optimism. How can I get through things with realistic optimism? This is an excellent, one of the best as a mother, one of the best books I've ever read. So I suggest have a look at that, and it's got some really great skills in there. There's a lot of videos, there's a lot of YouTubes, just as I said at the start, be careful who you watch, make sure they know what they're talking about, but then it's pretty good. I was going to show you a really funny video, but I can't now, because that would have put you in a good mood to go home. Never mind, you can do that now, because you know it's important. And John Wink said this to me once, and I usually put it up in my workshop, if it doesn't challenge you, it won't change it. And I think that's true of our kids, it's true of us, and certainly in schools, that we have to challenge ourselves, we have to keep learning and growing, but please never underestimate mental health and mental fitness, because it's with us every day. Doesn't matter if you go overseas to Tuscany or wherever you go, take your brain with you. And how you feel predicts how you're going to navigate life and how your children are going to navigate their life. So thank you for listening. I hope it's a little bit of a help, I know it's quick, but, you know, it's a bit of a foundation for you and hopefully I've given you something to think about. And I'm just going to open up to you for questions. And if, if there are any. Yes. Yes, you see. Yeah, great. <laughs> um, you're all very interested. You didn't touch much on fear of failure and how you switch that around. I know you've obviously got a character of fix and growth there. Yeah, well, that's it. That's actually so, how. Well, we were, have you ever failed? Well, every day. Every day. I fail all the time. Is it a failure? <laughs> no, I'm not asking. But we also succeed. You know, the, the other side of the coin. But, but failure is so important to resilience. And how, it's not the failure per se, it's how you view that failure. Remember I said to you, we've, we've all got a choice how we think. Thoughts and actions. Now, with my kids, I, I actually want my kids to fail because then they're going to build their resilience, they're going to build their problem-solving skills. In that book, The Optimistic Child, he talks a lot about failure, but how failure is usually temporary and changeable. For children with low levels of mental health, failure is permanent and it's never going to change. They're the kids who say, I'm always going to get this wrong. I'm never going to, I'm, I'm never going to be any good at that. 
Listen for always and never. But failure is an important part of life. I used to say that I could say just experiments. I say I'm experimenting every day. I get things wrong all the time. It's fine. You know, if I don't learn from it, I've got a problem. But if I'm learning and growing, you should be doing that till the day you die. So is that a failure or is it an experiment? Or is it just me navigating my life and growing as a person? But the kids that have been bubble wrapped are the ones who have no resilience. You can't fix things for your kids. You can talk to them about it. You can help them problem solve. But to not have them fail, like what do they call them, the lawnmower parents? And, you know, don't do it. Because they get, they end up in my practice in the city and saying, oh, I can't get through things. And things go wrong, I can't cope. Well, everything goes wrong in life, doesn't it? Every week you've got something going wrong. Failure is a part of life. Kids need to fail. But I don't frame it as permanent and unchangeable, which the optimistic child book is very good at explaining. It is temporary, and if I put some things in place, I can fix it. I'm very capable of learning and growing from this experience. So it's, how, it's not the failure, it's how you view it. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And I, I don't mind failing, I don't know about you. I was like, yeah, you know, it's okay. I'll learn something, I won't do that again. And hopefully that's what our kids do. They learn. You don't forget your own experiences. So you've got to make sure they get experiences. But it's not always, it's not never, it's not permanent. Tomorrow can be a good day. And that's where we avoid those bad mental health problems. Because they think this is never going to change. And it does. I always find a bad day, next day's usually not too bad. You know? Things are temporary. Why? Everything in life is temporary. You know? Changes all the time. Experiments rather than failure. Any other questions? Oh, good. Okay. Well, okay, no, Tom. No, no, yep, go. Um, sorry, guys. I just no. sort of noticed in the character chart, but I didn't quite get there, and I'm pregnant. It's probably the most important trait. I would like to see that I've been in school, and that's a sense of empathy. Empathy is crucial. There's so much concern on the, the individual and positive relationships, how we cross the line. Absolutely. Those experiences. Empathy is so important to develop, and you can develop empathy. Uh, it is a muscle in the brain. We've actually studied it quite extensively, uh, and it can be developed, empathy. But, uh, you know, there's practices that you can do. But the thing, um, I think, that what happens with empathy when they're young is they learn it from their family. You know, I mean, I'm a psychologist in my family, and I've had to, I'm very empathetic, and I've had to really try and attenuate my younger daughter's over empathy. I mean, she feels it too much. You know, when we're studying PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder in the military, we learn from brain scans that they thought they were weak and they weren't coping. Or we learn from brain scans they have high levels of empathy. So their, their compassion level is so high that they're just feeling the experience so badly. So then you can teach them gradually to wind that back, but it's very difficult. So both sides of the coin are, are troubling. But empathy is really important that you, but if you can get them doing things for other people, get them to see people who are less fortunate than themselves, and that becomes a part of the culture of the school and, and part of what they learn at home and is talked about, and gradually that uh, pathway will get stronger. You can measure it, actually. Yeah. Lots of work being done on empathy. It's a really good question. For me, with the work the Macaulay Community Schools doing in the borough of Brent in London, deliberate, intentional focus on teaching the future. Yeah, right. it should be taught. Yeah, because sometimes it gets missed. Mm. You know, and some people are born with a little bit more, a little bit less. You know, in that genetic component, but it's developmental as well. You're absolutely right. And and in school and in books and in science and you know. All the failures, talking about the failures and experiments and all these things, that if we talk about them and bring them to our children's attention when their brain is so malleable, that will stay for life. That's why well-being in schools is so important, because we've got them early. And we can buffer that, that mental illness and, and improve quality, you know, the whole quality of life. What you were talking about in terms of the, the relationships and... Yes. and you know, looking to, to spend your time with, with people who, 
who have a, a good outlook on, on life and, and how that you know how that can um, rub off on your child, for example, mm. or, or on who on how you feel. Where does that place the, the, the person who is really struggling with a mental illness and they are feeling anxious, mm. depressed? They're not the happiest kid to be around yeah. because they are seriously struggling. And if kids then decide, well, I'm not going to spend time with you because you bring me down, where does that leave that individual? Mm, that's a really good question. It's very difficult. Well, first of all, that child is very susceptible mm. to mental illness, so they have to be uh, checked, mm. you know, uh, mm. taken out of the classroom and actually checked. Um, I think building positive relationships starts with you. And if you see a child that is struggling, it's like all of us, if somebody cares about you or yeah. you think they care about you, it's a little spark. It might not be exactly what you need, but then the empathy one is good because there's kids in the class that love helping others. It's, you see it, don't you? You see it in some kids, they probably learned it at home, you know, whatever. But to have kids that you can take aside and say, oh, I see what Johnny seems to be struggling lately. You know, they say, oh yeah, you know, I've noticed that. Well, you know, we need to lend him a hand. This is what we wanted, what was us. Mm. And get, try and get the kids involved that are naturally seeming to do it. And, and that's one of their character strengths. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's good for them as well. Exactly. Then. It's good, you know, we get as big a well-being hit by helping somebody as the other person. True. And, and that's, that's been supported by many studies. Mm. So because we've got these things called mirror neurons in our brains and they were discovered you know, about 40 years ago and when you're with somebody who's in a certain mood, you catch it like you catch a cold. So if, if I go to you and you're sad, I'm very susceptible to catching that very quickly. So I either have to override it consciously, going, oh, come on, let's go have a cup of coffee, you know, I'm going to cheer you up or I've got you know, a funny story to tell you, you know, something to try and shift that mirror neuron because if you're in a classroom all day with a teacher who's not happy, you're going to pick that up. So I'm not saying we're happy happy all the time, that's not what I'm saying. But teachers and students, we have to learn to self-manage. Self-awareness first, self-management second. So what am I bringing into the home, into the classroom, to myself? Do I need to do some work? I mean, I've had to work on myself. And I say, well, my clients, we've all got to do the work. You know, and maybe you want to do it for other people. You know, and maybe you want to do it for yourself. But it's all good stuff. You know, but certainly grabbing that child and getting them into the group, talking about feelings is, you know, emotions is a great topic for kids. Mm. You know, empathy and, and all of the other things. So why are we talking about these things more? My parents never talked about emotion. You know, well, we didn't have an emotional vocabulary, really. We knew we loved each other. But, you know, that generation and the one before, they, you know, stoic. We don't talk about emotion. Now, a lot of my clients who struggle with that, I have to give them an emotional vocabulary. I actually have a sheet with negative emotions and positive emotions, and there's about 40 or 50 of them. And they go, oh, yeah, look, there's all these emotions. I don't even use that language. Sometimes we just don't even know how to, how to say it. So even teaching kids emotional vocabularies, how to express himself is just a great lesson. You know, oh, what's awe? You know, what's hope? You know, what's joy? You know, all of these, and what do, how do they differ? You know, do you get awe because you'll be at the sunset? But what gives you joy? I don't know. What's joy? You know? and, you just, and then the bad ones as well. And how do you get out of the bad emotion? And, you know, it's a whole conversation, isn't it? We all need those conversations. It's really important. Yeah. Anything else? As I said, I admire you so much for being here. It's not easy. You're not listening to me that long. I hope it helps a little bit. Any other questions? Yes. Many roadblocks, many roadblocks, you know, and you see, you can see it go up and down as well. But if you've got the culture, and I think, John, you'd agree that some of the experiences at Knox were when they had some tough times. 
but a lot of the staff at Knox said to me that a lot of their training in this area had helped them a lot to get through, didn't they, John? They said that a lot. And that was, you know, music to my ears, really, because that's exactly what you want when it hits the fan, you know. Is this going to work? And, and they, oh, many of them said that. So that was good. And I guess um, any school, any family, you know, on that mental health curve, we go up and down. We just want to keep knowing how to keep shifting it up a little bit. And in schools, if you've trained, and as parents you've trained, you kind of think, OK, I'm going to do that, or you know, I'll do something else. But you've got, you've got some techniques, and you know they work. We don't want to give you anything at school that doesn't work if it's tried and practised. So if the culture's right, there's culture and climate. Do you know the difference between climate and culture? Climate is the temperature of a family or an organisation, so it can go up and down really fast. So we had a school recently, and the headmaster died suddenly, and of course the climate went down, the temperature dropped, you know, everybody was feeling bad. But the culture picked it back up again. So culture's more the personality of the organisation of the school, and, and climate's more that up and down. So you might see up and down, but the culture will see it through because it's embedded, it's, it's, it's a personality of the school. So if this school values well-being as being one of its top priorities, you will gradually see culturally the people will leave who don't want to be involved. It will attract better staff because they understand how important it is and they're, they're vested into well-being as well and it attracts more students, and then the students get involved, and then the parents get involved, community, you know, and all of a sudden it's starting to stick. But sustainability, you're right, it's the biggest challenge and the greatest opportunity, I think. But I think for the future, this is a hot topic globally. Yeah, we've got to get more prevention and quality of life because our kids, you know, it's not good. So we have to do it. You know, it's just how. You know, I'll give you stuff and you'll learn stuff yourself. <coughs> you know, we all want a good life, you know, and life gives you a few hits. You know? Yes. Um, as the school now is moving into a, a, a new era, um, it's emerging of two different cultures, Ooh. and there's. I'm just wondering how kids um, navigate through a period of no culture. And a lack of identity. Well, right, it's, it's not as it's building. It's not no culture because there's culture everywhere. You get subcultures. So what what will happen during the merger is that you'll get subcultures, and you'll get certain people in certain departments who will find everything wrong with it, and they will that will be their mantra. And then you'll get other people who will go, yeah, you know, it is hard. It is because it's new, and it, you know, it's stuck. It's ever changing, school is ever changing, life is ever changing. This can have some real benefits for my child and for us as a family. So I'm going to focus a bit more on that because it is what it is. So we're going to move through that and we're going to make the best of it. Uh, but then there's always people to <coughs> change that just they'll not engage. And sometimes we need reasons to feel bad too. Oh good, there's a culture shift. Oh there's a culture for oh. Yeah, that's why, yeah, that's why I feel a problem. But it usually isn't because this school is a lovely school and the two schools together can be really positive and, and you can get a lot of benefits from that. It doesn't mean the old culture doesn't matter. That's, you have that inside you for your whole life. But then things change and they come together and it takes a little bit of time and a few really good people to get that in place. But then you go, you know what, two years ago, I was like, oh my god, well, this is terrible. Two years on, we're really, really happy with the way it's all turned out. So try and, as a realistic optimism, what can I personally do to help it move forward in a positive way for my child and my family? And everybody that goes to school, everybody wants to feel good. You know, it might be called something different or whatever, but we're all here for the same reason. We've got the kids here who want them to have a good life, good education. Teachers come here because there's a lot of meaning in their work. You know, schools are great places. You know, great families get together. So you want to be the person that brings the good stuff to the table, I think. You know, it's, I'm not saying don't talk about the bad stuff, but don't make it everything. And that's what often does happen. You see it. And the talk is always, yeah, we'll have one minute on the good stuff and the other half hour, let's talk about what's missing. 
try and help bring the good stuff through. Because you know, every culture has bad stuff too, so you don't want to take that with you, take the good stuff. But it can be good. Yeah, yeah I wasn't even thinking about negative stuff. Oh, okay. I was just thinking Sorry. about, um, you know, there's a lag time between transition, you, tra you know, yeah. with any change, there's that lag time yeah, before yeah. you catch your foot footing. Yes. You know, you're oh, completely. Yeah. And so while, and while I think kids are tremendously resilient in, in the process of change, it's um, I'm just wondering how is there? What can we do to support them if they're a little bit adrift mm. with? Knowing what the lay of the land is, yeah. Uh -huh. Not not that a negative adrift, but just a little just, bit like just feels weird. What feels different? Where, what's the shape of the land? Yeah, yeah. and that's just talking mm. and normalising the feeling. Saying yeah, what are you feeling? Oh, you feel like yeah. Mm. Gosh, naturally you do. That is so normal, mm. you know. And then just navigating them through it slowly. But if the school is um, supporting of the well-being and they're trying to help those children navigate that. I think it's a really good point you make. How do we navigate our kids through it? Parents are usually probably the best at it. And the kids go, oh, I miss this and I miss that and go, yeah. You know, first you've got to validate it. And then say, you know, is there anything that you can do and we can do to make that better? You know, so it might be, oh, well, maybe you're getting a new gym or you're getting um, something in the school that's really positive that I think you're going to enjoy. So, you know, validating is the first thing. Validate how they feel. Never not validate their feeling and let them talk about it. But then try and find something. Say, oh, well, okay, so but has there been anything good about the, the new environment that you've seen or does anybody mention anything? Usually they'll say, no, nothing, nothing. They go, oh, okay, it was funny, I was talking to one of the mums and she was saying, you know, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that might be one good thing. Yeah, and you know, you gradually just ask open questions and build on some of the good stuff. And gradually they'll start to see that. But equally, they're navigating change. And one thing we're sure of in life, that's the one thing they're going to have to know. Well, that lack of certainty. Is, yeah, you know, lack of security. Before it was predictable. I know this is going to happen next year and that's going to happen. Yeah. But now it's, and not that that's a bad thing either. Like it's not necessarily oh, yeah. that the kids look at that as a bad thing either. It's just different. It's just different. Yeah. And you can say, is that good or bad, or is it just different? And they might just say, oh, it's just different. Mm -hmm. And that's, you're right, it's security. Mm -hmm. And you can give examples in your own life, in your own school, and things, other change things that you had in the family. So remember when we moved house and you all felt really different, it was a bit scary? It's kind of like moving house, you know? First it feels really strange, but then you gradually grow it home. And that's it's very similar to a new environment at school. But this thing is real key, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. But change is good for kids. Mm. Well, they do it better than the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're better. John, did you want to have a, a word to anybody or uh, just uh, end the night? Or? Well, well, I can end. Yes. Did you, hear the, did you hear the hint? Can I end the night? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just so saying. Yeah, it's been a long night. But look, uh, <laughs> Paula, Paula Robinson, no, I think tonight has. Um, taken us on uh, the first step on the journey and uh, I've been very, very keen to get her here since I started working uh, with school in my consultancy role um, because I know uh, that schools are working really hard, particularly um, not just in Sydney but right around Australia um, and right around the world to address the issues that she's outlined tonight. And. Uh, we, we can't just sort of say, well, let's teach and hope. We actually have to have a plan. We have to have a commitment to a uh, pastoral care program that is actually based on something that is uh, evidence-based. Uh, because we know that we can actually intervene and we can actually make things better, not just for our children, but for our families. And so we're we putting together a process which is uh, for the teachers first, because if we can't get the teachers on the side, one. it's not going to happen. Teachers. Right? Uh, teachers, students, because teachers need to understand what we've talked about tonight in greater detail, greater depth. We give them a chance to actually apply it to their own lives. And uh, I've actually witnessed some um, teacher meetings where it's been like some kind of evangelistic explosion. And they've actually realised, yes, I can do all these kind of things. And I've had, you know, male teachers stand up and say, my, my, my wife actually thinks I'm a new man. And I'm thinking, oh, gee, that's pretty good, you know. And uh, uh, because people don't actually realise, and teachers don't actually realise, 
where what they sometimes are doing. You know, what's, their, what's become their default position. And uh, they're getting through, and they, there are all sorts of options. So, teachers, students, parents, we want you to be on board with this as well. So, any program that we put in place will also be uh, training opportunities for parents. And uh, we hope that we can engage Paula in a, an ongoing way, I'm sure, you know, twist her arm a little bit, um, which is a great person to work with. And, um, you know, all the things that we've talked about tonight and she's outlined tonight and the questions that you've asked. Uh, these have been asked in many, many places, as you would well imagine. And um, what we do is we, we uh, uh, look at, you know, what is out there. We look at our own situation because what we would do here would not be the same as what they did at Canberra or they did at Knox or they did at uh, Geelong Grammar or they did at St Peter's. It would be tailor-made for our students, our, our school, our community. And one of the things, you know, um, that um, we, we're very, very much aware of is that Martin Sullivan and his team came from the United States of America at the invitation of the city of Adelaide That's true. to actually in, to, to bring positive psychology to the city of Adelaide, the whole city. This was a whole community change because the whole city of Adelaide, which is basically South Australia, as you know, um, was going through the most horrendous restructure transformation period. Now, shipyards were, were closing, uh, major manufacturing industries were getting out, uh, and you know there was a lot of stress, there was a lot of depression, and if you look at what's happening in South Australia now, it's turning around very, very quickly. Yes, there's a lot of inputs going in from government and stuff like that, but there was a whole population there. So we're talking about a whole city change. In the UK now. Yeah, and it's yeah, happening so. in the UK. Yeah. It's actually a minister uh, for wellbeing um, in the United Kingdom because of the issues that are there. So this can have a, a very big flow on effect, um, not just to your students, but it is a life skill. These are life skills that, that we're giving to our students because, uh, as Paul will tell you, in high-level businesses um, uh, right around the world, uh, high-level executives are all employing life coaches. And the life coaches are teaching them this sort of stuff that we've been talking about tonight. So I encourage this to, to, to really move forward. I've been delighted that Paul has been able to be here. And I think um, if I can thank her on your behalf, if you don't mind Tom, I'll do sure. that now. Um, because there are some, some things there if you might partake, partake or just hit the road. Um, but would you like to thank her for what she's brought to us tonight? <laughs> and um, enjoy the rest of your evening. Yes.